In today's gospel reading, we are only here in the 14th verse of, uh, of, of, of Mark, the 14th verse of the first chapter of Mark, and we are already here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. You'll recall the last time that I was here with you, I uh, made the reference that Mark was in too much of a hurry to have a nativity. There is no nativity in Mark. It really just starts with Jesus' baptism. But, ba- but Jesus is silent during that baptism. And there is a temptation um, that, where, where Jesus is, has, is sent out into the desert. The temptation does happen, but it takes place over only two verses, and there is no dialogue. There is no Satan talking to Jesus and offering him various forms of power like we see in Luke and in Matthew. All of that preamble is 13 verses, and here at the 13th verse, we hear Jesus' voice for the very first time. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As we begin Jesus' ministry, Mark wants to send us a very clear message. Mark wants us to know what it is that Jesus came here to do, what it is that sums up all of Jesus' teachings. And just like that five-paragraph essay you might have learned in middle school, Mark wants the introduction to be clear. A clear and pithy sentence. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Jesus is going to be speaking the good news. Mark references it twice in this reading, once through the words of Jesus and once to to set up Jesus' word. But the message of Jesus, uh, the the, the short version of Jesus' message is clear. One, it's time. Two, the kingdom of God is, is here. Three, repent. And all of this is good news. And so you should believe it. I don't know about you, but when I hear Jesus' introduction here, the beginning of these teachings, I have a couple of thoughts. I think, okay, it's time. Great. Glad that it's time. Let's get this thing started. The kingdom of God. That sounds good to me. Sounds like something I would want to get into. Uh, Let me hear more about that. And then in almost capital letters, I hear Jesus say, Repent. And I respond, Hmm, do I have to do that? Do I have to do the repent thing? Repent, repent. When we think about the word repent, and when we hear the word repent, we might think to ourselves, repent just a few weeks away? Can we exist in this after epiphany time a little longer? Why are we talking about repent? It's because our our images of repentance, our our, our images of, of contrition, um, are, or they're images of, of self-abasement of some sort, right? On our knees, praying for hours for forgiveness, telling a priest or God how terrible we are, how terrible I am. Maybe even whacking myself with a rope as a form of self-mortification, uh, of, of penitence. All of these responses to, to the need for repentance are true. You know, they're all part of our Christian history. But they are not the full story of repentance. They're not really what Jesus is getting to when he uses this word, repent. I think it is not all of what Jesus is saying for us to think about the ways that we think of repentance. Jesus uses an interesting and a very powerful word here. The the Greek word here is metanoia. Metanoia. Which literally means change your mind. It is as if Jesus is saying, the kingdom of God has come near. Change your mind and believe in the good news. Metanoia also has a flavor of a of, of turn around. Turn around and look a different way. Look the other way. Change your mind, turn around. In the church, when we make a confession, when we offer up prayers acknowledging the ways that we have fallen short, we uh, might be acknowledging the ways that we have messed up, but 
true repentance. What Jesus is asking of us here, what, is, what Jesus is commanding of us as he begins his journey under Mark's gaze, requires more than acknowledgement. It requires metanoia. It requires change. I've been thinking about this in the frame of our current age of political polarization. We saw an inauguration just this week, uh, inauguration, a new presidential uh, administration that came in the wake of an insurrection attempt at the Capitol on our the Epiphany that came after four years and then after eight years, that came after eight more years before that, where we have seen our world, pull, our, our United States world, pulled further and further apart into political camps. In our world, we might see and think about this idea of changing, of changing our minds or turning ourselves around if we think about it in terms of our political realities. We set up this dualistic, right, of Democrat and Republican, of progressive and conservative, but when we focus on uh, human expressions to sides like that of the political debate, we might see our family and friends or our neighbors focused on one or the other expression. And we might, and so when we hear Jesus say, turn it around, we might say, yeah, Jesus, they do need to turn it around. And the truth is that they'll say the same thing about us. We do need to turn it around. But this is obviously not what Jesus is talking about. But neither in this specific example would Jesus compel us or draw us into some kind of lukewarm middle. Jesus doesn't want us to find that way through the middle. Neither are we uh, left to disengage or to turn ourselves from our political realities. And so we might ask ourselves, so is it the right, is it the left, is it the middle, or is it nothing? And the answer is Yes, but also no. Those of us who've read the rest of the story, those of us who know what comes from the rest of Jesus' teaching, know that if we know anything about Jesus, we know that when it comes to the core of the rest of the gospel, what comes to the rest of the good news, from, in the rest of the good news, it is that if Jesus is against anything, he's against human ways of thinking human ways of organizing our world, especially the priorities that human minds on their own make and the institutions that we develop make as well. Money and sex and exploitation and marginalization, rich and poor, Jesus isn't a fan of the way that we structure our world. And every single one of his parables is about some aspect of the way that we, left to our own devices, would have our world be. And yet, it is also clear that Jesus understands that we could structure our lives in holy ways. What is required of us, Jesus says, and what Jesus says here at the very beginning of the story in Mark, is for us to change our minds. One of the things we do politically is that we make the case for how our way of seeing things is, is right or correct because it's somehow been sanctified by its proximity to Jesus. We do this. We choose this policy. We create this economic. That's how Jesus would want us to do it. But if both or all sides think this way, how can that be true? And why? We often hear us say, hear people say to each other, Jesus isn't political. That's actually a profound misunderstanding of Jesus. It is true. Jesus isn't a Republican and Jesus isn't a Democrat. Jesus isn't right and he isn't left. 
Jesus isn't actually a part of the system at all. But because of the incarnation and because of the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is near to all of our humanity. Jesus is near to all of our human systems while also being completely separate from them. Jesus is near and yet completely separate from all of them. When we look at our human systems and we think we see Jesus, whether it be in a political party or a political ideology or a set of economic principles in any code of ethics, if we think that we see Jesus, if we think we see Jesus, it's not because we are right, because Jesus is there, it is because our focus is messed up. It is because we see our world with crossed eyes. My apologies to Dr. Ketteritz for this metaphor, but I'm going to carry it further. Jesus is enough into our humanity, is close enough to our humanity, that the central sin of our lives and the reason the commandment of the Ten Commandments is, you shall have no gods before me. As we look at our world, we see our world with vision that is marred by our willingness and our desire to see God and to put God into the things that we like. We purposely look at the world and we cross our eyes just enough so that we can see Jesus and our realities and our opinions line up. Because God is so close to everything, we train ourselves to see no distinction, to see an overlap with whatever it is that we like. It says, repent. What Jesus is saying to us is, turn around and change your minds. Notice that your vision is actually blurred. The reason that repent, change your minds, is good news, is because it's an invitation to stop trying to make sense of the world while seeing a distorted image of it. It's a distorted image that we make for ourselves, where we superimpose God and Christ upon the stuff that we believe or have been formed to believe by our families. Jesus says repent because he wants us to see clearly recognizing that it's so much better to focus on Christ, to truly focus on Christ, and being focused there, focused outside and yet close to our humanity and to our human systems, we are able finally to see those systems and institutions for what they are. Tools to notice and to bring to the fore the kingdom of God that is so near and yet not the same as what we would create without the help of Jesus. And so this is why that Jesus is political. Not because he's in with any movement or party, but because he wants us to have done our spiritual work our spiritual work of repentance, which means acknowledging the ways that we've distorted our understanding of reality, wants us to have done it so well that we will be able to enter our world using our political system, using our power over economics, using the way we speak of philosophy, ethics, using our political body, in his image, and in the image of the kingdom of God that he announced, instead of the image of a political or economic ideology. This is difficult, but powerful and important deconstruction. It is difficult, but it is powerful and important work. And it is indeed good news. That is why we have communities like St. Margaret's like the Episcopal Church, or like our other churches throughout our world. 
It is because they give us the ability to be in partnership and relationship with people across the world. And to see that Christ is present in and near them. Jesus starts his whole ministry with an announcement that what is needed is repentance. Because it's so much better to see the world clearly, to uncross our eyes by looking at Christ. That is where the spiritual growth that is necessary to fully engage our world comes from.